This is number 21 in uh, our series on the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 9, and we're going to look at two important people. And they're extremely important because they typify Israel. And they are two believers that are going to um, show us what Israel is going to do in the future. And you have to keep that in mind. These two were saved before the Apostle Paul was saved, but their stories are given us here because they are typical. Uh, what happens to them is typical of what's going to happen to the nation of Israel in the future. So let's read about it in uh, verse number 30. When the brethren knew, that is, knew that the Grecians were, went about to slay Saul, which became the Apostle Paul, they brought him down to uh, Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Now, we spent a great deal of time uh, looking city to city and region to region as to just where he went. Damascus, Arabia, Damascus, Jerusalem, Judea, Caesarea, Syria, Cilicia, then finally Tarsus. And we saw the importance of that in that he tells us that when Jesus Christ told him to depart from Jerusalem, that he went from that point to the Gentiles. And he also told us in Galatians that that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles was given him prior to his trip to Jerusalem. So God changed the dispensation and began revealing uh, the um, Components of grace, way before Acts 13. Starts in Acts 9 and begins to unfold from that point onward. But now, the narrative here in Luke takes us back and forth so that we have to more or less go to this portion and bring it right to where it fits here in Acts and understand it and so forth. And uh, now we're going to be focused back on the Apostle Peter. So verse number 32. It came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters. He came down also to the saints which dwell in Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas. Now Aeneas means praiseworthy or one uh, that is worthy of praise. And of course, this is the nation of Israel. There's going to be a time when Israel uh, is going to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ with its national life. And that's what's uh, being talked about here. It's the Apostle Peter that's going to perform a miracle. And just as we saw when Peter and John performed that miracle at the Gate Beautiful, that there was uh, um, symbolism there. Uh, the man that got up and walked with them into the temple and Israel at the beckoning of, of, of John and Peter in the future are is going to raise up and walk into the kingdom. Now we have two more that are going to be raised. The one man's name is Aeneas. And he had kept his bed eight years. Now, the significance of this is when Aeneas is going to be raised, it is about eight years since the day of Pentecost. But did Israel, per se, uh, come to the feet of Messiah, repent, and call upon God to send his son back as their Messiah? He did not. Israel fell a year later, and things uh, began to um, degenerate from that point onward. So Aeneas, though one worthy of praise, is one now that is impotent. And Israel, from this point on, is going to be just like that. Israel uh, is going to have a life as such. She's going to have form but this man had the palsy. He was sick of the palsy, which just simply means that uh, his hands and his feet were twisted. He had form, but it was distorted. So you look at the nation of Israel, and that's exactly uh, her problem. Uh, she has a form there, even today she has a, a form. So there's a government, she's on the land. But most of those Jews that are on the land do not believe in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Therefore, they're distorted. Even though they have a national life, it in no way reflects 
uh, the potent energy, the power of what she will have when she turns to Jesus Christ. So Peter said unto him, Jesus Christ makes thee whole. Arise, make thy bed, and he arose immediately. Now, I jokingly said on Sunday night, you know, that uh, I hear that command every morning. And of course, I, I was joking. It, it's not every morning, it's every other morning or so forth. And somebody asked, well, what did you get Diana for a birthday present? Well, as, as yet, I'm, I'm still thinking and, and so forth. But probably the best thing that I could do for her is make the bed and vacuum the floor. But uh, anyway, I'm not uh, sure about that. But he arose immediately, and all that dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, again, let's consider this guy's life and the miracle that happened here. It's typical of Israel being saved after the church age uh, is ended. These are miracles after Paul is saved. Uh, this man had life. And he had form, but it was twisted, and he had limited function. If you'll hold your place here and turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 11. Romans, chapter 11. Now, this is what happened to Israel, but God is not going to leave her in this condition. Verse 11 says, Have they stumbled, Israel, that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, is salvation come to the Gentiles? Now, that's the, the uh, point of this whole miracle and the uh, symbolism of this man's life. Aeneas, symbolizing Israel, had a disease which caused him to what? Stumble and fall. He couldn't walk. He couldn't stand up. He, he just had to lay down. Uh, uh, he, he, kept his, um, he kept his bed for this time. He had limited function. And in the dispensation of grace, God is still going to preserve the Jew. But as far as the kingdom program is concerned, it, it's meaningless. They have no power. They cannot stand up and walk. They're fallen, and they're keeping their bed, as it were. But... When Peter said, and there, there's the key, this is the apostle that is the chief one who had the keys of the kingdom. Jesus Christ, make you whole. Stand up and make your bed. Why did he tell him to make his bed? Because uh, the implication is you're not going to need to keep it again as he had done the, these eight years. Uh, now, of course, he's going to get tired and sleep on it, but, but uh, you, you don't need it any longer. Make it and, uh, and get up and walk. So that's a, uh, exactly what he did. But it pictures Israel's fall and his raising again Israel's restoration. God has a future for the nation of Israel. Everything that has happened is just temporary. They're keeping their bed, as it were, because they can't stand up. They're fallen. But there's going to come a time when nationally Israel's going to turn to Christ as their Messiah. It'll just be a small group. It'll just be a remnant. But they'll be restored. And the kingdom will come to Israel. Okay, now let's go back. Now there was at Joppa. Verse number 36. A certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Either name uh, means a gazelle or an antelope. Uh, and it pictures grace in action. Have you ever seen an, an antelope run, a gazelle run? Uh, they are swift. Uh, they're full of life. They're animated. They can go fast. And uh, that's what, what Dorcas was. She was someone, notice the last part of verse 36, that was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. But it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. Now, this is, this is pretty neat here as far as um, the, the steps to get Peter from the ground to the top. Where was Aeneas? Well, 
on the ground. That's where he kept his bed. He couldn't get up. But the next place that Peter uh, goes is in the next chamber up. Uh, and, uh, and here is Dorcas. And he is going to uh, raise her from the dead. But the, the point is here that when he comes into her, she has no life. This person, Aeneas, has some life. He has a form, but it's twisted. She has no life. She's got a form. One indicates Israel politically. The other indicates Israel religiously. Here, yes, they've got a nation, they've got a government, but so what? It's twisted, it's deformed, it doesn't function as Messiah would have it function. But on the other hand, they, they, uh, they have a, a religion, but it's a form of spirituality that is empty. The shell is there, but there is no life. Here is limited function, they've got motion, but here is no function, she's just lying there. And again, it's going to be when at the end of uh, the age of law, Israel is going to be in that same condition spiritually. But in, in keeping with the call of Peter, the great commission that uh, given to Israel, um, Israel is going to believe and they're going to be raised. Now here's the thing. She was sick, she died, but she was washed. There's going to come a time when Israel's going to be cleansed, associated water baptism, repent and be baptized. I'm going to sprinkle on you, according to the new covenant, clean water and, and make you a nation. Uh, and they later in the upper uh, chamber. For as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, the disciples heard Peter was there. They sent two men desiring that he would not delay to come to them. So Peter arose and went with him. And when he was come, he was brought to that upper chamber chamber. He stood by him weeping. Now, now here, here, is the, here is the point. We've got a contrast between the lower chamber of the house and the upper chamber of the house. Between what Israel does by way of government on the earth, standing up, and, and what Israel has by way of spiritual life, which is a much higher calling. And that's why Peter was taken to the two rooms there. For Aeneas, he just simply raised him up on the earth so that he could walk on the earth. For Dorcas, she was in the upper room. She's going to get raised as, as well, but she typifies Israel's spiritual life and uh, a much higher calling. So he goes up uh, one floor, as it were. Okay, let's read on. Peter uh, put them, or rather, uh, let's look at verse 41. They stood by him weeping, showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. All right, here's uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, at one time, it's the, um, it's the kingdom program. At uh, one time, it's sell all you have. One time, it's share the goods. One time, it's do good works for others so that you as the remnant can make it through. But uh, it's... it's it's beginning to die out and it needs new life, especially after the um, rapture. Peter put them all forth, kneeled down and prayed and turned him to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes as she saw Peter and she sat up and he gave her his hand. Now here is the apostle Peter. And again, the, the implication is in the future, Israel has no spiritual life. Israel is going to be dead. Uh, everything that Israel did prior to this time, during Peter's lifetime, here they are now at the end of the dispensation of law, and nothing like that is happening because the spiritual life of Israel is defunct. It's gone. It's dead. But all of a sudden, the apostle Peter, in the form of the Great Commission, comes and Tabitha, Dorcas, grace in action, arise, Israel, arise. And uh, she was resurrected, as will the nation be. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Now let's hold our place here and go to Romans chapter 11 again. Verse number 12, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, the diminishing them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Verse 15, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. Now, again, 
Israel did not have a spiritual life. God put them away and he brought in a spiritual life for Gentiles. If a Jew wants to get saved today, it has to be apart from Israel's program. But there's going to come a time when Israel is going to be raised from the dead nationally. And Israel as a, as a group is going to be saved. And that's exactly what he says here. If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? Note what happened to Dorcas. She was raised from the dead. But life from the dead. Israel is going to be restored to potency. Israel is going to stand up in the form of an earthly government. Israel is going to be resurrected. There's going to be new birth there. Actually, the new birth pertains to the nation of Israel uh, and those who follow that program. We just get it by grace. Israel is going to be resurrected. So these two individuals are really important, and it's significant because their miracles happen after Paul is saved. And they typify what is going to happen in the future after the church is gone, the future for Israel. Okay, let's go from here to verse or chapter 10. of the book of Acts. Now we come to one of the grandest grace illustrations. And uh, we're going to see that uh, the Apostle Peter is the one that is going to uh, experience this. He's going to be a witness of it, but there's a reason why he is a witness of it. And that is to convince him so that he might convince others that God is going to the Gentiles apart from Israel. He just saw Aeneas be restored on the first floor. He just stood up. Israel's going to stand up. Dorcas on the second floor. But those things are yet future. Now he is going to experience something with regard to a Gentile that is totally apart from, from Israel's program. It's something that God is doing at that point, and it's different than anything he's ever um, experienced before. So, verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now, what is significant of this? Number one, he is a soldier. He is a man of blood. He is a man who uh, represents the Roman government that was keeping Israel under oppression at, at this time as, as well. Uh, eight years after the crucifixion of Christ, Rome was still pretty much embedded in uh, the nation of Israel. And of the Italian band, why in the world would but would Luke want to record this? Well, ask yourself the question. The prophet Daniel says that the people of the prince that shall come are going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, well, what group of people destroyed the city and the sanctuary? The Romans. Who, who uh, what was the core nation of Rome? The Italians. And so he's part of the people, he's part of the people of the prince that shall come. He's part of that group that will eventually be a core nation with regard to Antichrist. And uh, uh, he is being offered grace here. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house, gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now here is one of those uh, situations of the conveyor belts of history. He had a religion, he gave his money, he even prayed, but it didn't make any difference. Was this man saved? And the answer is he, he wasn't even saved. But God heard this prayer, why? Because it's the sinner's prayer. He wanted to know how to be saved. He had light and he wanted to act on that light. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel coming to him saying, Cornelius. 
When he looked on him, he was afraid. What is it, Lord? He said, your prayers and alms are come up. It's a memorial before God. Uh, we've had to mention this because we understand the genuineness of your heart. Now, send to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now, again, I want to remind you, who was in Joppa that was a predecessor of the Apostle Peter? His name was Jonah. In fact, we can go down there. Let's go back to Jonah. Let's go back to Jonah and chapter 1. And the word of the Lord came up to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Now note the difference here. The principle is grace before judgment uh, either way. But in the case of Cornelius, it was his heart was open to spiritual things as a Gentile. God was turning to the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit was trying to woo and win them. Uh, they, were, they were being brought into the dispensation of grace here. And so his prayers and alms are brought before God and recognized, and salvation was sent to them. Here, the principle of grace before judgment, their wickedness came up before God. And God said, okay, I'm going to give them one last chance to repent or else I'm going to judge them. But in both cases, he was turning to the Gentiles. He wanted them to be saved. In one case, Peter's going to learn his lesson quickly and move on. Jonah has to learn the lesson the hard way. Okay. Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to, to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. All right, now let's, let's consider what, um, what's going to happen here. Peter goes from the ground floor to the upper, upper chamber, and he's going to go to the rooftop. He takes three steps up, and he goes to the Gentiles. Uh, Jonah goes from land to the belly of a boat, to the belly of a fish. See the, the three steps up? But in each case, they go to the Gentiles. Peter, Peter is convinced in an easier fashion because he had been with the Apostle Paul. It takes Jonah to spend three days in the belly of a fish before he's convinced. I'll tell you what, that, that fish would have been coming up out of the water and I would have been convinced. It wouldn't take me long. And we know uh, uh, the story here uh, where Jonah finally prayed, verse number one, out of the fish's belly, and the fish brought him, says in verse number 10, vomited him up on dry land. Okay, let's go back. Back to chapter 10 of the book of Acts. It says he lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He'll tell thee what you ought to do. Now here is um, here's another um, good illustration here. The Apostle Peter is going to go up on the rooftop and he's going to overlook the sea and the land. Now what um, profession was Simon? we are told that he was a tanner. Now, this guy was, was a Jew, and uh, Simon was a, was a believer, and uh, there were Jews who were tanners. But there is a problem with being a tanner and being a, uh, an Orthodox Jew. What is that? Well, number one, when you, when you begin to gut the animal, what do you get on you? Blood, and you were unclean. The second thing was, you were not allowed to touch a, the carcass of a, of a dead body, otherwise you were unclean. And so he was uh, always ha having to, to wash and scrub and, and, and so forth. You know, oh yes, huh? <laughs> yeah. morticians had that problem too. But, uh, 
But in this case, he, the product he made to earn his living caused him to be at odds with, with God in the ceremonial law. We don't have uh, time now, but we will, we will look at it uh, probably sometime Sunday. So there were skins out there. Now, there, in fact, uh, there, there were skins all around because uh, he lived by the seaside for what purpose? Okay, number one, the sun and the breeze of the sea would, would cure these skins and dry them out and, and so forth. That's why he lived there, and so there would be skins all around. So when Peter walked onto that property, what happened to the apostle Peter? He became unclean. This is the point of, of the whole thing. He became unclean. Because anything that the blood touches, anything that a dead body touches, anything that a carcass touches, anything that, that the skin in, the, in this condition touches, uh, it, it becomes unclean. You've got to go through the process of, of making it clean. But during this time, the Apostle Peter was not. But let's read what happens here. On the morrow, as they went uh, on their journey, they were going from Caesarea to Joppa, Peter went upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. This was noon. Now, what's the significance of the noon here? Do we remember another noon illustration? At noon, says the Apostle Paul, at midday, a light brighter than the light of the sun came to me. Here's Peter going on the housetop to pray at lunchtime at noon, and he's going to have a vision. Here is Jonah. He comes from the land, ground level, a Jew on the land, but he, does, he gets on a Gentile boat and goes in, down deep and hides himself in the Gentile boat. And then he is in the fish's belly, about as low as you could go. Now here's Peter, who was on ground level, Aeneas, another level up, Dorcas. Israel's going to be raised politically. Israel's going to be raised uh, uh, spiritually. But now he goes on the housetop and leaves those two illustrations behind. Why? Because now the Gentiles are going to be saved apart from Israel. And he's on the rooftop because this is God's will for this particular dispensation. There's, a, there's going to be a change. He became very hungry and would have eaten. It was lunchtime. While they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great uh, sheet knit at the four corners. Now, let me, uh, let me just ask you this. We have studied the earth before. And we have, as far as winds are concerned, Four winds, corners are concerned, four corners. And each time we saw that that, that uh, number four associated itself with the whole earth. It is something global and the like. So what we have here is, and it's specially uh, noted that at, there were four corners to this thing. And it's indicative of the whole earth. God is doing something with regard to the whole earth in this case. And something that he had not allowed for a long time. What? Well, is let down to the earth, wherefore were all manner of four-footed beast, oh, uh, four-footed beast, wild beast, creeping things, fowls of the air. There came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, what, what's the significance of this? Well, we will uh, go to uh, the book of Leviticus. As a matter of fact, let's do that right now. Let's go to the book of Leviticus chapter 11. Book of Leviticus, chapter 11. And if you start reading at verse number one, the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, and he said, Speak to the children of Israel. These are the beasts which ye shall eat among the beasts that are on the earth. And then he gives some standards to go by, wherefore they could eat. Verse number uh, 8 says, Of their flesh shall ye not eat. Now he's referring to some others, like the swine. And their carcass shall ye not touch. They're unclean to you. Then he goes from here, the beasts of the earth, to those uh, that are in the waters, verse number 9. And he lets you know what you can eat. 
And then he tells, verse number 11, uh, there are others that will be an abomination to you. You can't eat of their flesh. Uh, and it uh, talks about the fins and the scales. Verse number 13, uh, these shall not be eaten. And on and on he goes. The fowls, verse number 20, that creep, they are an abomination. And he tells all of these things, and the reason that he does is so Israel might know. And let's go all the way now to, uh, to verse number 46. This is the law of the beast and the fowl and every creature that moves on the waters, every creature that creeps upon the earth. You've got to make a difference between the clean and the unclean uh, and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. So when the Apostle Peter saw all this, uh, he was, of course, familiar with these uh, prohibitions and allowances. You can't eat, you can't eat, uh, and so forth. So, come back with me to Acts chapter 10. Now, all of a sudden, he sees beasts and birds and bugs. <laughs> all of them are unclean. There's not a clean beast, bird, or bug among the bunch. Uh, and uh, the Lord says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And uh, Peter says, uh-oh, wait one second. Lord, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. I haven't even used dip. We've never even fondued it. It doesn't matter. I can't eat it. The voice uh, spake again. What God has cleansed, don't call it common. Now, who did Israel, humanly speaking, call common and unclean? The Gentiles. That's the, what's happening here. Uh, Israel has fallen. She is beginning to diminish. She is going to be cast away. She will be raised from the ground, as it were, restored, Aeneas. She's going to be raised from the dead, restored spiritually with all of the uh, ramifications to the temple, the, the law of Moses, uh, the new covenant, and the like. But now Peter's on the rooftop, and God is doing something uh, higher than what he's going to do with the nation of Israel. There's the third, third story here. In the case of Jonah... The Gentiles that Jonah led to Christ, the fish brought him back to the land and he went. And uh, the Gentiles that Jonah led uh, to, to Christ, or the message that God had for that day, are not in the body of Christ. They're still in the kingdom, part of the kingdom message. The person that Peter, this Gentile that Peter is going to lead, is going to be a member of what? The body of Christ. There, there's the difference. He's still a Gentile, but his, 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 the reason that he gets saved and where he is placed in his destiny and agency are two different things. Peter's on the rooftop. It's a higher calling than what even Israel had. So this was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. So uh, three times uh, the Lord said, Go, go, uh, go and eat, go and eat, go and eat. I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it. But now, note verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, I imagine he's asking himself the question, okay, I, you know, I really only had a light breakfast and <laughs> maybe I'm imagining things. Uh, or maybe he had too much for breakfast and he, he, was, he was sleeping and had this uh, dream because he had indigestion. Uh, he, he's doubting, you know, whoa, wait, let me, let me get this straight here. I, I know I saw it and I heard the voice, but, oh, that can't be right. God doesn't want me to eat those things. They're unclean. I've never tasted those things. He doubted what the vision which he had seen should mean, and behold, at the same time, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Here were unclean, uncircumcised Gentiles uh, standing at the gate of, of uh, unclean, circumcised Jews because they were in the midst of Simon's house. And there was death all around them. And uh, Peter was unclean, but he went to the rooftop and in his unclean state. He, he didn't purify himself per se. He saw this vision. All right, let's 
Move on. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek you. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. See, God the Holy Spirit's in it all. And there's another key. The Holy Spirit has to keep the agencies separate. He has to know, the, the right hand has to know what the, the left hand is doing with the Holy Spirit. Because the program is stopped with regard to Israel, God the Holy Spirit is not, is not uh, or Christ is not baptizing Israel with the Holy Spirit. He's got to be aware of a change in program, and the Holy Spirit tells Peter, I've sent these Gentiles. Why? Because the Holy Spirit today is baptizing people into the body of Christ according to grace principles. There's a difference. And so the Holy Spirit said, I'm, I'm making a change here. Uh, the, here's the plan of God. It once was this. Um, I once was the element into which men were baptized, but now I'm the baptizer. There's a change. Arise, get down, doubting nothing, I've sent them. The, and then Peter went down with these men which were sent unto him from uh, Cornelius. Behold, I am he that you seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, and they go through the whole thing, was warned of the angel, and he was called to hear words from thee. Now here's an, uh, an interesting thing here. How did um, Aeneas and Dorcas get saved? Well, uh, we are told, I mean, with the message that was uh, uh, relevant uh, at the time they were saved that Philip was caught away from the Ethiopian eunuch and he was translated to the very region where Aeneas and Dorcas were. And the fact that he kept he was a saint that kept his bed eight years, and that's within the time frame that Philip would have been there preaching the kingdom message before Paul uh, got saved. So Philip went from that point and he went all the way up to Caesarea and he stopped. Now here is the apostle uh, Peter. He went all the way up to Caesarea and he stopped. But between Philip and Peter, both going to Caesarea, who got their right square in the middle? Do you remember the, the order of how Paul went? Damascus, Arabia, Damascus, Jerusalem, Judea, Caesarea, to the Gentiles. That's, that's, that's the way it's going. So this, this business of Caesarea, which is the northernmost uh, city uh, there, he goes from there and launches a ministry to, to the Gentiles. And it's right at this point where two Jew Jewish believers in that particular region uh, had miracles for Israel's future. But Peter goes to the third level. And uh, after, after Paul is in Caesarea and he sees this and a Gentile is saved. It's the very same uh, city from which he went into Syria, Cilicia, Tarsus, and involved the salvation of the Gentiles. So there's a connection here. All right, let's, we just have a few minutes. Let's move on. He called them in. He, he lodged them. Now, what did he do? He called them into a place which was ceremonially unclean, but these were Gentiles who were unclean, they all spent the night together. Imagine that. On the morrow, he went to Caesarea. Cornelius was waiting for him. What's the first thing that he said? Verse number 28. You know how that it's unlawful, it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come into one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Why was it unlawful for him to do so? Because the Gentiles were, generally speaking, unclean. Uh, you couldn't have blood. You couldn't touch a carcass. You couldn't have seed on you. And because of their uncircumcised uh, condition and because their uh, lack of bathing facilities, they had sexual relations and seed on them probably constantly. And anything that the seed touched was considered unclean. So any Jew that came into a, a Gentile house was automatically unclean in that fashion. You have to remember all of these things that made them unclean. So Peter says it's not lawful, but God has showed me 
that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now let me ask you the question. Where, in whose writings, in whose ministry, in whose message are the Gentiles not called common or unclean? The answer to that is Paul's message. And, and that's the significance here. Peter was beginning to get the picture, as it were. He was beginning to see and perceive that God was going to the Gentiles. Now, I've got just a few minutes left, and um, we'll um, come up here to verse number 43. And here was the message that Peter preached to Cornelius. Totally different, except for one element that he preached on the day of, of, of Pentecost. He came into the house of Cornelius and said, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him should receive remission of sins. What was the message on Pentecost? Repent and be baptized to receive the remission of sins. Here salvation is apart from baptism. But what else? Cornelius was an uncircumcised Gentile. It was apart from circumcision. But even more than that, it was apart from the laying on of the apostles' hands. Because, note, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And that, that's the point. Yes, he gave them the same gift as they got on Pentecost, but he, he did so. The, the norm isn't receiving that gift, but this was an exception to the rule so that Peter would say, this has to be of God. Who am I that I could withstand God in this matter? If God gave them the Holy Spirit and the Spirit said, I've sent these men, go with them, and this is what happened, uh, so, there's a change in program, and Peter saw it. They of the circumcision which believed were astonished. Of course, they hadn't seen the uh, sheet vision here like Peter did, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go to chapter 11 here and see their conclusion in verse number 18. When those of the circumcision heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then has God also to the Gentiles granted repentance to life? Rhetorical question, the answer of which is, yes, he has. But the importance of this is that he did it apart from the kingdom program. No circumcision, no baptism, no laying on of hands, and Cornelius, this Gentile, and his whole family and household were saved.